Hi everyone, I'm Nilofar Salehi. I teach at the iSchool. Um, this year I'm helping Deirdre co-direct AFOG um, and it's a great pleasure to introduce Dan Green. Um, we're super excited for this talk. Um, Dan is a fellow iSchooler at the University of Maryland. He's also um, spent some time at the Social Media Collective at Microsoft Research New England where he was a postdoc. Um, a lot of his work is ethnographic and there's a lot of overlaps in his interests and his approaches with folks at the iSchool and AFOG more broadly. Um, today he's going to be talking about his book, um, The Promise of Access, uh, which explores questions of how the problem of poverty basically became a problem of technology and how that has changed organizations. Um, so we're super excited for the talk. Um, Dan is going to start with the talk and then we're going to have a Q&A after. Um, you don't have access to the chat feature, but there is a Q&A feature in, in Zoom that you can use. And then, um, so you can just post your questions there and then we'll get to them at the end. Um, and, general, and Jeremy will be coordinating the question, the Q&A. Um, so without further ado, Dan, uh, welcome so much to the iSchool and we're really looking forward to your talk. Thank you so much, Nilafar and Deidre, for the, the invitation. I'm really excited to be with you guys today. Um, so yeah, so this is my not so new anymore, but new-ish book, The Promise of Access, Technology, Inequality, and the Political Economy of Hope. It's based on a couple of years of field work in different DC institutions that turn the problem of poverty into the problem of technology. Uh, I'll talk for 40-ish minutes, um, and we'll have some discussion after that. I'm really looking forward to um, speaking with all the brilliant people here at AFOG. There's so many different kind of perspectives here that I, um, you know, it's just a pleasure to have you guys work with my ideas. So I, I, what I want to talk about is how we understand the relationship between personal computing and economic security. So why is it that we feel that we must learn to code? or else. This political common sense in Gramscian terms is very strong. I call it the access doctrine. It persists across political parties, geographies, and economic conditions. And it doesn't really work on its own terms. You know, we don't actually have a surplus of coding jobs. There probably isn't a skills gap in the way the Wall Street Journal tells us. Um, but the idea does a great deal of work in those institutions that prepare people for the labor market or care for them as they try to re-enter it. Indeed, in the last 30 years, places like schools and libraries have been completely remade around this proposition that we can solve poverty with technology. Not because the results are necessarily there, not because librarians or teachers believe in this proposition in their heart of hearts, but because embracing this mission saves institutions that are themselves under threat overwhelmed by the social problems they face every day while they're perpetually short on money and increasingly short of legitimacy. You know, who needs the library if we've got the Wikipedia? And it is this process of institutional transformation that teaches us to believe in the power of technology to solve poverty. These are then coping strategies that make racial and economic inequality sensible and navigable. They provide a script for individuals and institutions to be heard and recognized. This is why schools and libraries start to walk and talk more like startups. And they usually fail in the attempt, you know, poverty is this massive complicated problem. Schools and libraries just cannot be startups, but they have no option except to try. So after outlining these big picture ideas, I'll show how they play out on the ground in DC's public libraries. The book also explores startups as kind of the ideal type organization on which uh, public institutions are forced to model themselves. Uh, as well as tech-focused charter schools as another urban institution enlivened by the access doctrine. And then I'll conclude with what I hope are some more kind of hopeful notes about the kind of political organizing that I feel can break tech sector hegemony, its hold on our cities and our economic imaginaries and remake these institutions. So these posters started showing up in DC's subway system, our metro, largely in those neighborhoods still majority black in 2013. Each one in the series declared the internet, your future depends on it, next to a photo of a working class black Washingtonian and their story about using the DC government's digital training resources to get a good office job, often after a career in the service industry. Uh, one explicitly calls out 20 years as a beautician, you know, and the constructions to text for more details. 
So quote, Sean earned an advanced certification in six months. Now he upgrades computer systems for the US Small Business Administration. He uses technology to help people start businesses. So can you. The people in the posters look ahead, smiling at their new future. Quote, Fabian learned Microsoft Office in eight weeks and used her new skills to write, design, and publish her first book. She's using technology to pursue her dreams. So can you. New skills and new tools here lead to better jobs, ones in which you don't have to work with your hands. But this is not just a matter of bringing single individuals across a so-called digital divide, you know, this gap between people who have internet access and the skills to use it and those who don't. The dream here is much bigger. By, by changing your tools and your skills, you can drive the economic growth of your city and change the community in which you live. And this language has changed over time. You know, we've gone from digital divides to digital inclusion to STEM gaps to this demand that we learn to code. But this idea that our future depends on personal computing is at least 30 years old. So Clinton and Gore or someone in their administration coined the phrase digital divide and promised to quote, pass on to our children an information superhighway that will help them live out their dreams. Bush too campaigned against consumer internet taxes by arguing quote, it's the flow of information and knowledge which will help transform America. And we've got to make sure that flow is strong. Barack Obama inaugurated Computer Science Education Week by imploring students, quote, don't just buy a game, make one. Don't just download an app, design it. Ivanka lobbied for education department STEM grants by saying, quote, it is vital our students become fluent in coding and computer science. As an aside, this is like a genre of photo that I have dozens and dozens of examples of, you know, since the 1980s, it's just like a staple of the political campaign and, and really any anti-poverty initiative to have the powerful rich white person like leaning over the shoulder of the brown kid or the young kid staring at the computer and they're kind of looking forward to their future. Um, I don't know what to do with that, but I have lots of them. Uh, and, and of course, our new vice president uh, in a campaign stop in a Des Moines barber shop in 2019 asked two young black women what they were majoring in. And upon hearing that they were pre-law and poli-sci respectively said they should learn to code. The internet, your future depends on it then is not just a story about individual economic destiny, but regional and national economic destinies. This is the power of the access doctrine and from it flows new policy, new curricula, new degrees, new jobs, new buildings. And there, you know, there are some problems with this at a high level. So the jobs of the future are largely not in software development. You know, the Bureau of Labor Statistics projects that most of the job growth over the next decade is gonna be in low wage service work, largely food and healthcare, largely not requiring a college degree. Um, nor has the economy of the recent past conformed to this story. Um, so this is largely you know, a book of labor and organizational sociology. Um, and labor sociologist Lewin Grusky have this great 2013 paper where they attach um, occupational skill measurements to returns from the current population survey. And they find that it is analytical, critical thinking skills that have produced the greatest wage payoff since 1979, not the technical skills that are supposedly so in demand. And, and of course, you know, at the end of the day, the access doctrine and child concepts like the digital divide, the STEM gap is, is ultimately unfalsifiable. Because even if today's technological training regime doesn't work, there's always going to be a new technology that arrives tomorrow, you know, we're going to have a, a virtual reality gap, a metaverse gap, whatever. Uh, and, and for those interested in, in shifting the burden of economic transition to individual workers, they'll always demand new skills. And, and there have been a lot of people much smarter than me, um, Peter Capelli, Virginia Eubanks, uh, especially Christo Sims, very much influenced by his work, um, who have tried to disprove this common sense, show that it doesn't reflect reality and the harm that is inflicted on people by that, um, trying to fit uh, the world to this mold. And they show how complicated the problem of poverty really is. But the idea is immune to refutation. We keep going in circles. We keep having this debate. You know, I'm, I'm part of the problem. I keep saying that digital divide is, is not a binary. We keep instead having to return to this. So instead, I want to explain why we're stuck in this rut, what keeps us on these terms. In part because it is clear to me that the real lives of everyday poor folks do not conform to the story about defeating poverty through technology. If you saw those posters in the Gallery Place Metro Station in DC, walked upstairs and rounded the block, you'd see MLK Library, the central branch of our city's public library system. 
And for several years, I was lucky enough to hang out with Ebony, her boyfriend, Sean, and their friends, Mia and Josie. They were homeless. They spent almost every day in MLK's computer lab. The internet was an important part of their lives, but it wasn't the promised land of the future. It was just, you know, their every day. Sean said that when he first lost housing after he and his dad were evicted, quote, the library became my best friend. It's where he made friends, where he got online to chat or play games or follow the news about the occupied DC encampment that he had worked on. I was always a computer man, he told me. And I, I love that because there's a whole story and I was always a computer man. It's a, it's a story about Sean's hobbies, his friends, the welfare state institutions through which he traveled. He was not left behind by technological or economic progress as those posters might suggest. Rather, he used the PC and the institutions around the PC to build a rich and varied life and to claim space in a gentrified city that was increasingly hostile to the working and workless poor. Sean then was a computer man, an activist, a black Washingtonian, a homeless man, a boyfriend, a library patron, an artist, much more. I was always a computer man then is both a humble biographical fact and a political statement about the security he felt behind a screen in the library. And that security is what he needed most from the library since it, it couldn't provide him actual housing, not its job. And he largely ignored all the digital training opportunities around him. The library, of course, leaned into the city's version of the access doctrine, the internet, your future depends on it. And as they did so, there was less and less room for people like Sean. To understand why we have to rewind to the early 2000s. And some of this may seem specific to the kind of like weird regulatory relationship DC has with Congress, but it, that's just an outsized version of the kind of like city versus state fights that are all throughout the US, especially when the state is majority white and the city is not, you know, this is reminiscent of like Lansing versus Detroit, you know, uh, Illinois versus Chicago, uh, Sacramento versus LA and Oakland, that kind of stuff. Um, so in 2004, there was a lot of talk in DC of radically downsizing our library system. The system had been dealt a very public black eye in March of that year when a virus took down every computer in the system for an entire month. Today, library officials talk about that as this kind of come to Jesus turnaround moment for the system when they realized how high the stakes of the game were. Ultimately, this was all a symptom of austerity. So in uh, 1975, 620 full-time employees worked at 20 DC libraries, but in 2004, only 431 worked at 27 libraries. So many more libraries, many fewer staff. The library then was like most of DC public services, understaffed and underfunded. It's funding reliably a much lower proportion of the municipal budget than peer cities. This was born of the budget cuts that Mayor Anthony Williams insisted on as part of his plan to get financial control of the city back from Congress, you know, similar to the financial control boards that have been imposed on Detroit and other cities. Um, the library system then was short on financial and political support, overwhelmed by a homelessness crisis that it was unequipped to handle, and that problem would only get worse for the library after the recession hit in 2008. The computer outage was just the most visible sign of these tensions. Williams did the mayor thing, you know, he gets a blue ribbon committee together to talk about the library system's future. They have a report, it concludes, quote, the District of Columbia Public Library must be transformed if it is to be the successful, relevant institution needed and deserved by district residents. The transformation requires a new service dynamic as well as a new infrastructure of technology and facilities. So a new people and new stuff. Fast forward 11 years and that vision is coming true. In March of 2015, I'm at the Martin Luther King Jr. Central branch of the library system with Dave, mid-30s white man at the head of MLK's digital programming, Sherry, mid-40s black woman, upper level administrator, and the Friends of the Library charity group, um, middle upper class white retirees who lobby the library about policy changes, run book drive, fundraisers, that kind of thing. Um, we're listening to a presentation about the library's upcoming renovation, and our backs are to these um, glass cubicles that separates the Dream Lab presentation and co-working space from the Digital Commons Computer Lab, whose 150 seats are full as usual and dominated by the city's homeless population, uh, mostly older Black folks, more men than women, who walk over every day if they aren't dropped off by shelter shuttles that also do pickup runs in the evening. Dave... Eyes gleaming, asked if we'd like a tour of his new maker space. Uh, it's, it's this reclaimed meeting room upstairs that is supposed to be proof of concept for the renovation that they are still seeking funding for. 
so we walked past the librarian monitoring the 3D printer through the Great Hall where a mural of Dr. King overlooks the local internet entrepreneurs who are setting up chairs for their demo series. We head up two floors in the elevator. We pop out past the video visitation room for DC jail. We round the corner from the Black Study Center. We go back into the cavernous stairwell that had been a cruising spot for most of the 80s. We cut through some locked double doors and we're in a sunny meeting room whose windows look out onto a uh, Roof Chris Steakhouse. And it, and it was real hard not to get caught up in Dave's kind of hopeful gee whiz attitude as he's showing off his 3D printers, the laser cutters, the CNC machine, the laptops. He's pitching the maker skills that the fabrication lab is going to teach as a new literacy for a new economy, something that would help defeat the STEM gap and provide the creative technical workers he said we were so desperately short on. Consumers then would learn to maintain their devices and save the environment. Skilled techies would have a space to inspire underprivileged communities. One library friend pitched as a poetry lab that'll help save the arts in the 21st century. And there's just so much hope in that space, so much pressure on it. And, and a lot of it is recycled from earlier stories that people told about the three-year-old computer lab downstairs. And that was where most people spent most of their day. And it was itself just a massive upgrade from the 14 computers that until 2012 had made up the main computer lab of the central library branch of the capital of the richest country in human history. There was just so much hope, so much pressure placed on those tools, that room, that library and those librarians, even though it was mostly used by library visitors rather than the homeless folks who were there all day, every day, just like the Dream Lab startup space downstairs. It offered a reassuring vision of the future in a city where a flood of new tech workers post-recession was accompanied by a housing crisis and a jobs crisis. So DC saw a 29% rise in the number of homeless families and a 12% rise in total homelessness between 2010 and 2015. We have an active policing policy that keeps about 5% of the city uh, on probation, on parole, or in jail. We have the widest gap between the top 10% um, and the bottom 10% of income earners um, because the middle fell out of our uh, local labor market post-recession. And it is during recessions that libraries, which are largely funded from local property taxes, are hit extremely hard. You know, so they, they lose a lot of their funding uh, at the exact moment that they see more patrons of more needs than ever before. This makes them particularly sensitive to the needs of politicians and donors who can relieve that pressure. In a very real way, the digital library embodies a hope that these structural challenges can be overcome with the right tools and the right skills. Indeed, the library is literally rebuilt around this story of hope, this responsibility for local development. DC public libraries produce this hope as a way of legitimating their existence in the internet era and as a way to manage their role as one of the last remaining safe public spaces for marginalized city residents. This requires massive but urgent changes to the operations of the organization, its structure, its appearance, its personnel. And if they fail in their mission, they have to start over again because the stakes are just too high to quit. I call this process of constant technological and organizational experimentation in support of social mobility bootstrapping. It is a hopeful but frantic process pursued because it garners the library resources, legitimacy, and clarity to its many competing demands. But because that mission secures the organization, it must be defended at all costs. The very people the mission is meant to serve are marginalized in support of the mission. Because for the library to maintain this hope in, quote, using the technology to improve lives, as librarian Grant put it to me, it has to regulate or eliminate other potential uses of its space. So what does this look like day to day? Here is a joke that one of my librarians, April, regularly made with colleagues whenever she saw a patron engaged in self-talk, fighting with someone else, eating, watching porn, touching themselves or a partner, or bedding down for the night on a strip of cardboard in the reference section. She gave out imaginary stickers as she walked uh, the library to patrons that she thought were using the space appropriately, inappropriately, or just wrong. You know, and to me, this is obviously, you know, it's extraordinarily condescending, if not pathologizing, to call, you know, someone who might be having the worst day of their life dumb as paint, but it, it captures a really important aspect of this relationship. 
uh, because you know, April has a master's degree. She's a middle-class white woman who has moved to the city recently for a secure but very stressful job. Uh, she can tell you how to verify Google results, do basic HTML, find your nearest polling station come election time. She loves open access. She loves Barack Obama. She's an ideal liberal knowledge worker. And her professional identity is formed by a series of confrontations with not that with poor or working class patrons with only a high school diploma, if that, much younger or much older Black and Latino patrons who've been priced out of DC housing, patrons of mental illness, patrons who mistake socialsecurity.com for socialsecurity.gov. These are her patrons or customers, as she usually said. And th this mission of progressive outreach and its raced, gendered, and classed overtones has been with the profession since at least the founding of the American Library Association in 1893. White middle-class women in the progressive era worked as readers' advisors, teaching immigrant patrons to move away from entertainment materials and towards Anglo-American classics, uh, inculcating sufficient literacy and numeracy to enter formal job and housing markets. Today, most of the librarians that I talk to describe their profession in class and gendered terms as a pink collar one. April called them, quote, mavens of knowledge. This mission took on a digital turn when the Clinton administration put the digital divide on the political agenda, but also pushed the 1996 Telecommunications Act, which gives the US some of the slowest, most expensive internet in the developed world and makes libraries pretty much the only place you can get it for free. Um, in part, this is also because we largely skip the internet cafe phenomenon that is, is very popular elsewhere. Uh, more generally, you know, how many places are left in any American city where you can spend all day at a comfortable public place without buying anything, have a wealth of learning opportunities at your fingertips, and receive free guidance from people with advanced degrees? The library is it. You know, and more than that, you know, MLK offered ACA signups, flu shots, dance lessons, Spanish conversation partners, a rich archive of DC history, and much, much more. I, I think that old joke about like if we propose the existence of libraries today, they'd be dismissed as a communist plot is, is correct. You know, these are incredible spaces. But it was also, you know, it was decades overdue for renovation and those present needs for a public space conflicted with the library's needs for space oriented towards the hopeful future of knowledge work. This conflict is institutionalized within library computing, the rules for it, and the selection and training of library personnel. So there's a lot you can do with a PC. There we go. Um, but at the library, the PC is a work machine. That's it. For example, the librarian who taught intro to PC basics, Betsy, emphasized both the skills of how to write and left click, create folders, that sort of thing, but also concepts, the different names for flash drive, how deletion worked, what she called the proper language of the industry that would prevent you from being embarrassed at a job interview. She constantly referenced the civil service exam, even if it didn't really exist anymore, even if most students wouldn't be applying for those mid-level bureaucratic jobs. These values were also built into the lab's personal computers and vice versa. So patrons use their library card to sign up for a session at a central terminal. They're then directed to a queue that's on a you know, widescreen TV on the wall. There were 70 PCs in the three-year-old digital commons lab uh, in 2014, 2015. Um, in 2012, before it opened, Elena uh, was supervising the three-hour waits for 14 computers in the old popular service lab, and she told me that even if she had triple the number of computers, it wouldn't be enough. And she was right. You know, they tripled the number of computers. It was not enough, especially in D.C.'s sweltering summers when, unlike winter, there's no right to shelter for the homeless. Uh, then there's hour-plus waits for a PC every day. Uh, the Pharos login system not only managed the queue, it allowed librarians to monitor every session's activity from a central terminal and choose to end or extend that session. Um, so if you're watching porn repeatedly, you might find a pop-up screen saying, please don't do that. That's not using the library correctly. It's not using the internet correctly. On the other hand, if you're working on a job application, you might ask the central desk for a little extra time and have it given to you for that session. Staffing is also very important because you, when you choose the correct librarian, that in turn chooses the correct way of using the library. On the one hand, this is a long-term issue about the librarian pipeline. So a lot of the veteran librarians that I interviewed really regretted the transformation of library schools into information schools. We see Becca's reading of the shift here while she was getting her master's in library science in 2000 as the tragic downfall of the profession, the embrace of technical over service values, 
And there's a bit of projection here because the, the word science was never in the name of the college. This is just something in the, in the story that she's telling me. Um, but she was probably the most junior librarian I knew who still called her patrons patrons rather than customers. Then there's another filter at the level of local hiring. So uh, Eugene, mid-20s white librarian, explains to me here, the Digital Commons 70 computers, the Adobe Creative Suites, the 3D printer, the book printer, those uh, glass enclosed co-working spaces that they loan up to startups. All that is incomplete without a group of librarians who are younger, hipper, whiter, and more tech savvy than the veterans at the branch. Their enthusiastic kind of startup aesthetic is essential to the space. They look like the future. Everyone called them the hipster contingent, and they performed the hope that linked personal computing with knowledge work and social mobility. They were a source of a lot of debate in the librarians union local since a cohort of veteran black librarians were bought out right before the hipster contingent was hired and the digital commons opened. They were obviously much cheaper than the veterans too. But this story is incomplete. The bootstrapping library had a specific organizational form for personal computing, you know, long rows of PCs, lecture hall style, uh, open, surveilled. Uh, but what we might understand is this kind of downward pressure of the institution and its production of space is always resisted or reconfigured by the people within it to, to greater or lesser degrees. You know, patrons have some agency. So first I wanna talk about how homeless patrons, the vast majority of regular library users at MLK adapted to the institution's reorganized space and then explore how they built new places, new libraries within it. So patrons were well aware that librarians were happy to help fill out social service forms or food stamps, uh, you know, affordable housing applications, whatever. And they picked particular staff members of particular reputations for this or that task. Most patrons also acknowledge that something like porn is, is doing the library wrong. You know, most of it was filtered after all, but you know, you can get away with it with a little bit of work. You choose the right site, you switch between windows. You nonetheless keep hardcore porn open in a room with 150 people in it. You know, I did not go to, I went to the library pretty much every day for two years. There's not a single day that I was there. There was not somebody watching porn. We should recognize that this takes a lot of skill, you know, both in terms of like navigating the system, but also this kind of, um, social awareness of this ideological conflict within librarians that prevented them from cracking down too hard. So as Rachel explained here, librarians wanted to preserve the library's traditional orientation towards the free flow of information, particularly for people without another means to access it. But they also wanted to preserve that kind of hopeful future orientation towards knowledge work. You know, you wouldn't watch porn at the office. This conflict extended to other areas, but porn was always the first example of doing the library wrong that everyone jumped to tell me, just as job applications were always the first example of doing the library right that everyone jumped to tell me. There was a similar um, pattern in patron interactions with the police who roamed the library branches, uh, hands on their pistol, five or six on duty at a time in MLK. There's a special dedicated police branch for the libraries. Um, they're walkie-talkie, always the loudest thing in the room. They had a control room upstairs to review their camera network. They are allowed to touch patrons where librarians are not. They tended to enforce norms for sleeping, drugs, fights, phones, theft, or exposure, rather than personal computing proper, unless a librarian calls them in to act as kind of the conservative right hand that sternly enforces the liberal left hand's rules in kind of like an interpersonal representation of neoliberal politics. Mia, Ebony, Josie, and Sean, um, part of that incredibly generous welcoming crew of homeless black young people that I spent much of my three years hanging out with, um, were there pretty much every day. You know, any, any day that they weren't at a day program for a clinic or a visit for social services, um, being poor is, is very expensive and time consuming. Um, but you know, besides that, they're at the library every day. However, they only ended up at MLK in 2014. Um, because they, before that, they had been moving from branch to branch, uh, fleeing cops who harassed them for, you know, sleeping at a desk, talking too loudly on their phone, not using the space professionally. Finally, uh, ad patrons adapted to institutional space, not just through human, human interaction, but human computer interaction, whole bunch of strategies to get around this login system. Um, so Mia, before she was gifted a used laptop, would email whatever she was working on to herself before her session ended, run back and grab Josie's card, 
run up and start a new session as soon as possible. You know, she told me that even if the librarians were nice and gave her another 15 minutes, it's not like you could complete something like a job application or a housing application with an extra 15. You, you needed to cheat in order to succeed. And this parallels how folks uh, share kind of other state issued ID cards, like um, clinic issued bus passes, food stamps, that kind of thing. But patrons did not just adapt, they also carved out their own libraries distinct from MLK's reorganization of its space as a training center for knowledge work. Some of these had to be suppressed, others could be incorporated into the bootstrapping library. So there were a lot of play places in the digital commons. Uh, what my field notes always call noisy corner was a group of tables and chairs of no desktop PCs. And for 2013 and much of 2014, it was, especially after school let out, taken up by loud card games, mostly Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh. Uh, friends met there every day, cheered each other on like any other sporting event, but that's not using the library right. You wouldn't do that at the office. So one of the hip new librarians, Jeffrey Mohawk, mechanics overalls, uh, invited a friend of his who lived in a suburb outside of the city to drive in on weekends and organize official Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh leagues. You know, they give each other jackets and badges. They have tournaments in those glass cubicles that are empty um, during the weekend. Um, problem solved, you know, Pokemon contained the weekend cubicles. A lot of collaboration here too. Uh, even as personal computing was designed as a pretty solitary experience in that kind of lecture hall style. Collaboration was obviously encouraged in the glass uh, cubicles that were loaned out to startups. They were always quite loud, um, but patrons' collaboration looked different. Uh, drug sales, usually synthetic weed or crack cocaine, which the police cracked down on quite hard. Uh, Craigslist, these pyramid scheme guys who were on their phones at the PC, kind of figuring out how to pitch people. Uh, oil men, like you see here, black, usually Muslim men with uh, little vials of fragrance that are either on belts um, or these little kind of wooden racks that they carry around. Uh, they're working together during the day to map the best neighborhoods and subway stops to sell on later. Cops usually leave them alone. Uh, there's also a vibrant repairs culture here where people, you know, trade peripherals. They give each other tips for speeding up a used laptop or, or downloading anime. Everyone came to Mia for that. Uh, but also analog stuff, you know, how to fill out the best social service form for maximum benefits, you know, the nice lady to visit at the office, whatever. But the most important use of the library space, especially for the homeless community, remember, last truly public space in the city is a place for rest, a place to check email between dishwasher shifts, to stop after your day program because most shelters kick you out during the day, to sit and rest and sleep because it's 100 degrees out in our swampy summer and neither shelter beds nor sewer grates above the subway stop next to MLK are quiet, comfortable places at night. Uh, and many psych meds are strong sedatives. Similar to the porn issue, librarians are conflicted about this, but the fact is you can't sleep at your PC at the office. That's not productive. So you can't sleep at the computer lab. So librarians patrol, knocking, on the desks of people who are napping, calling the police if they don't respond. So we've seen that this hope for the future of the library as a digital skills center is not naturally occurring. It has to be produced through the bootstrapping process. And that process of reorganization requires the regulation of places that diverge from the library's plans. It was literally rebuilt to become, as the slogan went, a new transformative space rather than the old transactional one. That renovation, a uh, $208 million project that would take three years, required, as Grant tells me here in 2014, admitting that the contemporary computer lab had failed and that it needed to be taken apart and put back, back together again. The homeless patrons watching YouTube or dozing off in the back did not fit the hope of the digital commons or the fab lab upstairs. And so those rest places, collaboration places, and play places that patrons built were to be in the new library physically segregated from the startup workspaces, the seminar spaces, and the transformative technologies that would form the heart of the new building. Bootstrapping then made the overwhelming problem of homelessness more manageable. You knew who to kick out and who to let in. And it provided the library path to legitimacy when it was under threat. 
And this was an uneasy process because of this um, vision of how the world worked came into conflict with the library and with librarians kind of historic sense of purpose, as well as patrons own agency to reshape the space. In, indeed, while librarians were happy with getting the renovation, it was years overdue, many of them were quite upset with how those prototype features that we talked about here played out. Um, and they were especially distraught at how the city government seemed to have no plan for those homeless folks uh, who would lose this community space while it was under construction. You know, this is functionally the largest day shelter in the city. Um, when it's closed, hundreds of people are redirected to a day center that's basically on an industrial park at the edge of the city next to the dump, the mechanics, the, the strip clubs, all the loud, noisy, dirty places that you don't want in the middle of the city. You got to take three buses to get there, no restaurants, no places to chill. Plans for a downtown day center never materialized. Um, librarians, to their credit, hustle to get resource pamphlets together for patrons as the closing date approaches, but it's, it's hard to overcome the kind of trust gap between patrons um, and librarians that have been built into the library up to that moment. Uh, homeless patrons and the Friends of the Library staged a protest that you can see some pictures of here on the day of the closure, but it was just clear they didn't have enough power. You know, the city government just rolled right over them. Um, the library actually reopened a couple of months ago in a beautiful new space, but because of COVID, it's not exactly the same yet, so I don't, I don't really feel justified in commenting on it. What we see then is a new bootstrapping institutional culture that uh, replaces older public service cultures, or, or rather it's kind of built over them as the economic, political, and technical environment changes. The story is not unique to MLK or even to public libraries. Um, so in the book, I draw on organizational sociology, specifically neo-institutionalist theory, uh, to compare MLK with STEM-focused charter schools in order to craft new organizational theories and formalize the mechanisms behind bootstrapping. What causes these repeated attempts to solve poverty with technology? Why do libraries or schools end up looking like Apple stores in the process? There are three overlapping pathways. First, the meritocratic model. Middle-class helping professionals, majority white and plurality black DC, believe that the skills training that led to their labor market success is broadly replicable. They worked hard, they went to school, they got skills, they got good jobs. You know, even if we know in the abstract that a lot of our organizational or individual success is owed to structural factors or sheer luck, our professions kind of mobilize our biographies as a tool for uplift. So the helpers help the helped on their terms. That's what I do as a teacher, right? We have all these fancy theories about how education actually works, but the way the institution mobilizes is to say like, all right, this guy has the skills and the degree. He's gonna take the, the good stuff out from his head, give it to you, and you will somehow survive this, this hellscape economy that we've built. Um, that's what April did with those teachers, or I'm sorry, with those stickers. Second, technological professionalization. Um, so here, bridging organizations present active professionals or professionals in training with models from the tech sector. The example of startups and techies is made readily available and in some cases must be followed to secure grants or other resources. You know, at the Gates Foundation is the, the largest funder of education in the US. Um, Google is extremely important in that space as well. Uh, iSchools now train librarians alongside database engineers. That is not a nefarious plot. It's just a fact of how our institution has grown and changed compared to what it was 40 years ago. Um, think about MLK's hipster contingent in that regard. Uh, elsewhere, we can think about places like Teach for America or the Brood Institute, which train new teachers and administrators and network existing ones by importing um, management language, business language into schools. Um, so the top three education officials in DC government are all Brood Institute alums, and that is no way unusual for a major city. Third, mission ambiguity. Attacks on institutional finances and legitimacy and the collapse of other non-carceral portions of the welfare state leaves these places overwhelmed and under-resourced. Solutions are unclear. You know, recall those debates about what to do with sleepers. Focusing on skills training and tech provision makes these uh, complicated problems much simpler and demonstrates activity to powerful stakeholders who might relieve pressure on your organization by, for example, funding your renovation. Together, the meritocratic model, technological professionalization, and mission ambiguity push schools and libraries from public service to bootstrapping. But it is not a clean break. People are still there to help and be helped. 
And so these institutions that are charged with creating specific people for a specific economy, what Marxist feminists call uh, social reproduction, are riven with contradiction. Some spaces have to be saved to produce a new workforce. Others have to be disciplined or destroyed because they are too expensive or they produce the wrong kind of people. And these contradictions, you know, as with any contradiction, they determine the kind of the terrain of struggle, the landscape, but not its outcomes. You know, it's the rules of the game, but not the score. In order to end the cycle of bootstrapping, helping professionals, I argue, must build power alongside those punished by this cycle in order to regain control over our public institutions and use them as a staging area for a broader fight for liberation. So by way of conclusion, I want to talk about how socially reproductive labor, um, you know, it's, it's often less of a strategic priority for radical politics, not least because that work hospitals, schools, libraries, the home is often done by women for lower no wages. Uh, nonetheless, it is an extraordinarily important site of struggle because it must occur and it cannot be outsourced. But also because it brings together workers who are fighting against degraded working conditions and the struggle of the community they serve who want to reclaim the space that is owed to them. This is often called social justice unionism. It's a long tradition in American libraries. You can see it with these Contra Costa strikers who are saying they serve communities, not institutions. It is an organizing strategy seen an upsurge in 21st century teachers unions in particular, in large part to ensure that they have the overwhelming support of their constituents behind them. The Chicago's teachers union is the best representative of this philosophy today. Um, so the radical core caucus wins leadership in 2010. They turn the union towards actively organizing existing members in the community. They make this whole new organizing department that is not just focused on union members, but also parents, students, other workers doing things like driving the bus, they're building reading groups, they're having cookouts and barbecues, teach-ins, all this stuff. And this ensures that when they go on strike in 2012, working class Chicago understands that teachers' working conditions are students' learning conditions. And they're striking for the city against the 1% who are shutting down schools, filling our classrooms, replacing veteran teachers of TFA scabs. Management thus loses their best talking point, you know, greedy unions hurting kids. Rahm Emanuel keeps up this fight in 2016, and then the contract that comes out of that next strike is really remarkable because it doesn't just preserve their pension and their raises, but it moves some of the city's real estate development fund um, from real estate into schools, which never happens. We also saw this in LA, a little closer to y'all, when teachers struck not just for working conditions, but for an end to the over-policing of black and brown students, you know, like daily frisks, that kind of thing. And it's this sort of collective unity between helper and helped that defeats the uplift narrative that drives bootstrapping. You know, it's, it's not a vertical relationship where you're trying to bring someone along with you across the digital divide. It's a horizontal relationship of solidarity where you recognize that your struggles are, are not identical, but are enmeshed in each other. And the failed protest over MLK's closing showed that solidarity was not strong enough there. But the fact that similar things like this have been happening throughout the country gives me a lot of hope that we can do more of this. And this kind of social justice unionism may seem very far afield from these struggles over personal computing, but it was at the heart of these 2018 teacher strikes that gripped the country and showed up in places that you would not expect, you know, West Virginia, Arizona, Oklahoma. So West Virginia teachers, for example, were furious that their health insurance plan made them wear Fitbits in order to price out their deductible. Uh, elsewhere, cloud computing resources similar to Salesforce um, are used to surveil us at work through our own and through our students' activities. So redesigning these institutions is then not just a matter of having different relationships with different people, but recognizing that our stuff kind of changes those relationships. So we have to change that stuff. You know, we have to redesign our desks, our PCs, our queues, our Wi-Fi, our security, much more. And this is, after all, the original meaning of participatory design. That framework was not developed in research labs or corporate focus groups, but in Scandinavian manufacturing, where workers demand a say in the design of their factories and their products. And I know in this spirit that we can build different libraries, different schools, different tools, different people, a different economy. So I hope that I've shown the story that is driving so much of our thinking about poverty today, the internet, your future depends on it, did not appear out of thin air. It has to be told over and over again, reinforced through web filters, grant applications, progress reports. These are coping strategies that make overwhelming economic inequality sensible and navigable. 
But if access today means fundamentally an opportunity to compete, then an alternative should not be so hard to imagine. If the world as it currently exists is one where we have to be granted the tools necessary to strive for excellence, to innovate beyond our current dire straits, to outcompete inequality, surely we can imagine another world where innovation is boring and excellence is unnecessary because the good life is ordinary. So I close by asking, what would we compete for if so many of us would not starve for losing? Because we have quite a lot of work to do. Thank you. So thank you so much. Um, so for those of you in the audience, if you'd like to ask any questions, now is the time that we have allotted. We've had a little over 10 minutes. Uh, if you'd like to talk, uh, just raise your hand, or if you'd like to type your question into the Q&A, that works as well, and then I can read it aloud. Um, whatever works for you. Any takers? <laughs> I'm sure Neil, Afar, Jeremy, and I all have our own ideas of uh, lines of inquiry we would love to learn more about, but we don't want to um, uh, kind of preclude questions from the attendees. We'll give you one more second, and then I think we'll jump in. So I guess, Dan, I'm going to jump in. Um, on the kind of social justice organizing side, were there particular affirmative visions aside from the concerns expressed about the displacement of particular communities, particularly vulnerable communities, but were there like alternative visions that were coming from organizing across communities in that kind of social justice unionizing way or were they more on the kind of professional angst side and, and less, um, yeah, still among the profession rather than organizing? I, I appreciate the question, Deirdre. I And I think it's of the utmost importance at this particular moment. Um, I, I wanna be clear that like uh, the book is by and large a tragedy of these specific places because they were not able to resist. You know, they, they were changed, these, these um, organizational process, he is just rolled right over them because uh, they hadn't sufficiently organized. Uh, the Washington Teachers Union has kind of stepped up since then, but the Teachers Union uh, has only successfully organized one charter school, which makes up 50% of our schools, and then that school was mysteriously closed at the end of the year. Um, so I, I think there are, you know, I, I can see that vision elsewhere, but in, in DC it is largely these visions of I think um, we can think very literally about that, how that kind of horizontal solidarity would like break down barriers in the space itself. So the school, for example, um, teachers thought about uh, what if it was a school, not just for the students that were serving, but for their parents as well? You know, what if we had English classes on the weekends? Like, what if we had some of our students who are, you know, second generation immigrants um, teaching those English classes for credit? Um, what if this was also a place for food? What if the Wi-Fi available here was accessible and like, you know, outdoor workspaces that we set up when the building was closed? So there are those kinds of things there. Um, elsewhere, I think it is a, um, you know, during the teacher strikes, during some really incredible um, organizing in New Orleans libraries during the um, pandemic, when uh, basically New Orleans libraries are funded by this one kind of tax that exists on your property, and that is a classic austerity tactic, because if you can identify the single stream of funding, you just get rid of that and get rid of the institution. Um, and the mayor put it up for a vote, said, hey, you guys want to lower your taxes? This means we'll uh, lower library funding. And Americans, of course, want to lower their taxes, but New Orleans librarians, along with uh, the local DSA chapter, along with patrons, along with the Friends of the Library Group, knocked thousands of doors and just handily defeated the ballot measure uh, with Americans agreeing to keep their taxes high. 
And the, the stories that they're talking about there are similar to the stories that you hear in like Chicago Teachers Union and LAUSD and um, places like that, where they think of the building um, the institution and the relationships within it as kind of a fortress that you can build up and use as a staging ground to go elsewhere because people are constantly passing through this place. Um, you're constantly moving ideas, money, students, parents, bus drivers through it. It's, the, it's really thick with these social relationships. So we should take advantage of that and recognize that these are the places that we can talk to each other. Um, it's, it's uh, you know, we live in a very especially during Zoom season, we live in very alienated, isolated individual time. So recognizing that these are the places where these kind of cross-class, cross-race interactions happen is really important. And that's that's something that can be um, used to build these relationships into a form of power. It's not inevitable in any, by any stretch of the imagination, but it does make these places unique compared to something like the way we thought about organizing, um, you know, like factories back in the day or something like that. Right, great, we have a, a question from the audience in the Q&A, so I'll, I'll go ahead and read it out loud for you. Uh, we've got a couple, I'll start with this one. Should libraries try to serve the homeless better, or is that an abdication of the need for shelters and of the specific ideals that libraries might serve if they were not busy acting as de facto shelters? Yeah, that's, it's something I struggle with a lot. There are, you know, I mean, what's what's clear in the DC model is that no one was being helped I, either like it was a de facto homeless shelter that was not able to provide the services that people needed. So, you know, I, I, you have to go through here both like the, the kind of normative or categorical claim, what is a library, what should it be, and then the kind of strategic claim about like, okay, what is best able to serve homeless people. So there are some pretty good examples of uh, libraries being used as kind of centers for other social services within the city as one-stop shops because that's where people come. Um, San Francisco is actually is actually pretty good at this. So is Seattle. Um, Honolulu is another good example uh, where they, you know, set up shop with social workers. They bring people in from like housing services, uh, job search services, the health department, that kind of thing. Uh, um, set up desks where people can see them, uh, you know, hand out stuff, uh, have vaccination clinics, you know, those kind of things. Um, DC uh, at MLK hired a social worker, but uh, no one ever saw her on the floor. Uh, it became clear to me during interviews and, and um, some kind of correspondence that I had access to that she was hired largely because the condos across the street were complaining about all the homeless people uh, lining up for the bus. And so they needed to look like they had a plan for homelessness so that they hired a social worker. So, you know, there are these other visions of how to help people and they are able to do that. I, I do hear though the nervousness in this question about like, is that taking libraries away from their mission? Is it able to um, relieve the pressure on the organization? And I, I think ultimately these are still stopgap measures because the organization is a place of last resort for people in distress because all the other parts of the welfare state have been cut back. Um, because people don't have a, another public space to go to, you know, it's the same way teachers are also therapists, nurses, social workers, whatever. Uh, um, that's because of all these other things, problems that have been forced onto the school. So I, I think there are things that the institution can do to adapt and to better serve these people. But in part, that pressure just kind of indexes all the other crap that the library has been forced to deal with. So it's an upstream problem, I guess. Yeah, thank you. Um, another question from Cedric asks, I'd love to hear more about how this line of thought has developed further with Zoom mediated education during the pandemic. Yeah, I've, I've been thinking about this a lot and I, I've, um, I've actually talked a lot about this with Anne who's, who's in the room right now and I think her, um, her dissertation is a really important in this regard. Um, the, so I'll say, um, I'm very involved in uh, police reform uh, and especially school policing. And there was a massive uprising last year of the like that has probably never been seen in, in American history. But most of the meetings that we've had about like what to do since then or during then or who to lobby or whatever are over Zoom. And it's not in like the, the 
shitty church basement with cold coffee and like, you know, weird posters on the wall and the radiator doesn't work. And we're all kind of sitting there in a circle. And, and the thing about Zoom is that like, it uh, is not spontaneous. Uh, Zoom content is almost always, it, Zoom content works best when it's quite well planned. So this keynote, for an example, this lecture. It does not, you know, if we think about like the conferences that we've attended on Zoom, it does not capture those like accidental conversations that we all have as we're kind of milling about after things end or that like, hey, oh, that was cool. You know, Steve, I know Steve, let's go get coffee together kind of stuff. That's not as good. As, um, that's not what Zoom is for. So I, I think that's the main thing in terms of organizing that's been difficult here is that you miss that spontaneity. Like I was at like my first like kind of in-person community meeting last night after such a long time and like standing next to these kids that like I knew would not be comfortable talking if we were all on Zoom and they were looking at a bunch of elders. And it was just, it was just a completely different space. Um, I think too that uh, some of the kind of policy dynamics that I was talking about earlier were um, are much more visible in, in the Zoom era. So, you know, for example, there, there's this contradiction that we work through in the book that the it is precisely by placing internet access as the means to resolve poverty as the thing that connects you to global labor markets. It is because of that that we ultimately deregulate internet telecommunications market as much as possible because the theory is that competition there will help serve competition elsewhere and generate more spaces for competition. This then gives us these oligopolies of internet service such that most Americans have one, maybe two sources for high-speed internet. So like everyone goes online in March of last year. And then in my county, you know, they give out a hundred thousand of these like Wi-Fi hotspots to kids that don't have internet access. And they got to return them in another month and a half. You know, it was a no bid contract to give them out because nobody uh, was competing for them. Um, and then ultimately they were just broken to hell and people had to send them back in. So we, we keep, even though this like digital divide language has fallen off, we keep seeing this dynamic where we've, you know, specified one particular way in which we can succeed. And that ends up failing on its own terms. It ends up undercutting itself precisely because of the, the way in which it's been set up. So, so Zoom has been really revealing, not just in terms of like what the problem is, but what we need to do to solve the problem. Um, I wanted to jump in. Um, this is a really, really interesting conversation and I wish that we could go longer. I'm particularly really fascinated about this um, interaction that we're seeing between the like digital spaces and even more of those with zoom and the very public um, spaces where people go to rest and hang out. Um, but we are out of time um, really looking forward to continuing the conversation, um, I wanted to thank Dan one more time for um, the talk and the conversation and um, I don't know if we're moving are we moving the zoom or yep. All right, thank you so much, um, and we'll continue the conversation. Thank you all. It was such a pleasure to see everyone, um, and on to the next one. Thanks so much, Dan.